So in the qualitative and implementation methods group in Cochrane, we recommend three methods of qualitative evidence synthesis, and I'm going to show you some worked examples of each. We recommend framework synthesis, thematic synthesis, and meta-ethnography. Um, the reason why we recommend those um, thing, these three methods um, is because we want, uh, we've selected methods in which that you can um, use the findings in a specific way and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that in a, a few seconds. So I'm just going to ask you to use the chat to let me know if you've used any of those methods. Um, just pop in the chat, yes, you've used framework synthesis or you know, you've used all three of them or you haven't used any of them. Now, unfortunately, the whole audience can't see the questions or the chat, um, but it will give me an idea as to um, what you've done. And it will actually give me a bit of an idea of how to sort of um, frame the sort of questions at the end when you ask me them. So just pop anything in the chat that you'd like to. So the reason why we've chosen framework synthesis, thematic synthesis and meta-ethnography is it allows you to do something called transforming um, the primary data in the primary studies. Um, and to, under, to explain this for those of you who've got no experience of a qualitative evidence synthesis, you need to understand how findings are constructed. Um, and so the way that we actually um, sort of classify findings is we call first order constructs as being quotes from the participants in the primary study. So a quote um, that you will see um, from somebody, a participant in the study, is a first order construct. When those quotes are actually grouped together and coded and developed into a theme and they've been interpreted by the primary study researchers, they're called second order constructs. Now, in a Cochrane context, we want to go to a third order construct, which is we want to come up with new synthesized findings and hypotheses, which are developed by the review team or the review authors that move beyond the interpretations in the primary studies. And in order to do that, we need to not only um, translate the findings from the primary studies one into the other, and then you come up with a summary of findings across the studies. What we need to do is move beyond that and we need to transform those um, findings into new understandings of the phenomenon that we are particularly interested in. So we have chosen three methods in which you can transform the findings to come up with a more nuanced understanding. So that's why we have chosen framework synthesis, thematic synthesis um, and meta-ethnography. OK, but there are other methods. Um, there is a, there's probably about 40 or 50 different methods that you could use, but we've particularly chosen these methods for a decision making context. So if you don't know where to start and um, I'd say 75 percent of you on the on the webinar um, have got some or no experience, we've written some guidance um, and um, the, 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 the reference to it is here. Um, and we've come up with the retreat framework um, of things to work through, such as your research question, the epistemology of, of, or the theoretical and philosophical underpinning of where your research question comes from, the time and time frame, the resources, the expertise, the audience and purpose and type of data. So you have to work through all of these things and it helps you uh, when deciding um, what method that you're going to use. So if you're not um, doing this review in a Cochrane context and you can use any of the sort of 30 odd methods, then we've given you a decision making framework that you can go through in order to make a decision. There is a guide that you can download from the web, um, which is free to download, or there is an article in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology that summarizes as well. So please do have a look at that. So I think the bad reasons for choosing a method um, are the frequency and use of the method, such as metrothography, so everybody else is using it, so I should. The popularity or sexiness of the method, such as realist synthesis, it's quite new, so I should probably use it without perhaps even understanding it. It's what a friend or a colleague or a mentor has once used or other people have had bad experiences. So I think you need a proper framework for choosing your methods. And I hope that we, in giving you this guidance, we've given you a more systematic approach for choosing the right method. 
The next question is when you should select your review method or design. And I think if you are used to doing quantitative reviews, you'll be used to identifying an a priori protocol which, which outlines your method. With a qualitative evidence synthesis, it's not that easy. And it does help if you have knowledge of the type, the quality, and the richness of available qualitative studies before you choose your method. Um, and the Social Care Institute for Excellence in the UK have produced guidance on how to do a systematic map. Um, so you actually do a systematic search, you map the available studies to start with, you find out what's out there, and then you choose your um, methodology. And that, if you've got the time, that's a very good way of doing it. If not, be flexible in your protocol, say that you'll make a final decision on your methodology once you know what data you're working with. So I mentioned just there that one of the key things to, uh, to think about when selecting your methodology is how rich or thick your data is. So um, qualitative data from so-called thin studies um, will not sustain um, the more interpretive and transformational approaches. And they're much more limited studies that are very thin, such as often many clinical qualitative studies are quite thin. Um, limit you to do the sort of um, aggregation type approaches where you just sum um, the sort of the findings from the studies rather than interpret and translate the studies and transform. The thick and rich um, studies will, are much easier to sustain something like a meta-ethnography. Um, in reality, when you're searching, it, you, it's never one or the other. You tend to get a mixture of thick and thin studies. Um, and, you know, that, that's quite helpful when doing a thematic synthesis or framework synthesis type approach, which can cope with both. Now, to clarify um, how thick or thin are findings and where do you find the findings in qualitative research, most people would think that the findings are in the findings section, but they're often not. So here is a typical um, study um, with a findings section. And in qualitative um, research, you report findings rather than results. This is a screenshot from what I would call a study with rich description. And I'll, I'll sort of explain why. So you've clearly got your findings. There's a nice statement of the findings. So there's a, um, an overarching high-level finding here that, that's it says the overarching or core theme that emerged was to capture. Then underneath it, it goes into a really nice explanation of why that theme was so. Um, there are then um, sub-themes that are explained, um, which I've circled in yellow. Um, there are quotes um, that illustrate the themes, as you can see here. Um, and then there are explanations under the themes of the, the um, primary researcher's interpretation of, of what's going on. Um, as in here. So the first order interpretations are the quotes and how people make sense of their own experience. And the second order interpretations are how the primary researchers have interpreted those. So this is a really nice example of a, a rich, conceptually rich study. And these are the sorts of studies which are ideal to do a synthesis with. The thinner studies don't have this level of detail. They're very thin on detail, hence they're called thin. OK, so um, you can't help with your question what you're going to end up with, um, but you do need or it, does, it is helpful to have a mixture of rich, conceptually rich studies and those that are, um, are not so conceptually rich. Often you have to make decisions about, um, you know, do you try for a geographical spread of studies and do you sacrifice the sort of thickness of the studies to make sure that you capture other things of importance, such as um, you've captured different populations and things. But that's for another webinar. We can do a whole webinar on um, selecting studies for synthesis. Also, you might find that a certain theory has been associated with the um, study, which makes it nice and rich. So here in the findings here, it talks about stigma. And as many of the, you will know, there's an existing theory of stigma by Goffman. It's a well-developed theory about how to identify and uh, look at the acceptability um, about stigma and how it's socially managed and constrained. So this particular study also used um, a theory, um, and that actually added to the conceptual and theoretical richness of the study um, and the findings that you could then extract. So sometimes important findings aren't in the findings section at all. So this particular um, piece of information was found between the introduction and methodology sections. 
And at the bottom here, it says we applied a social determinants of health perspective in the third level of data analysis to help organize the themes and the sub-themes sub that emerge from the inductive open first level and focused second level coding. So there's more information there about the richness. So I think the key message is that findings can be virtually anywhere in the paper. Don't just look in the findings section. So if you are starting off, here are some safe options. So if there's a pre-existing theory or framework, then select framework synthesis. And then the, it's offshoot of that is best fit framework synthesis. And I'm going to go through what that is in a minute. If there's a proximate or closest theory or framework, then you can use best fit framework synthesis where you create a composite framework. If there's no theory or framework, then go for thematic synthesis. If you want to develop a theory, um, then go for metaethnography. So that's your decision making. And it depends on the level of theory and the richness of the studies. And as I said before, to do a metaethnography, you do need conceptually rich studies. So in your decision making in a Cochrane context, that's what we would suggest that you go through. If you're unsure about selecting a social theory, and we've written some guidance in Cochrane um, and published it in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology, which gives you um, some guidance on how to choose a theory and the attributes that you might be looking for in a theory. And that might be a, a psychological theory, such as the theory of planned behavior. Um, it might be actually um, a theory, for example, a, a, a sort of conceptual framework um, of how you implement something in practice. So we've provided a, a guide. Um, again, this guide is free, uh, free to download through Cochrane, or you can go and get it through um, the article in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology.